right, Kristen Carey, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. Yeah, I'm. I was so excited to be able to have this conversation. Uh, you know, we had a great uh, chat, kind of side conversation at the last Sexual Integrity Leadership Summit that was in St. Louis, and um, I just really enjoyed that because um, uh, the session that you did, the breakout session that you did, that was really on this issue that we're going to talk about today of this Emmanuel approach in in prayer and in counseling and recovery and all of that. Uh, it just really um, it struck a chord with me because I think it's something that's so vital to overall healing in a person's life. But before we jump into that, I'd love for our audience to just get to know you a little bit. So can you share with us a little bit about, you know, who you are and what kind of work you do and maybe even how you got into this space of counseling? Absolutely. So my story of why I work in sexual integrity ministry and working with betrayed partners um, started in 2002 when I got married and found out that my husband at the time was addicted to pornography. We were in full-time ministry. I thought I had a deal with God. We're serving you. You're going to protect us. The whole situation just blew up. And over a couple years, it became clear that my husband was not going to be able to change and sustain recovery. And I all of a sudden in 2006 found myself as a single mom. And so that was my journey with betrayal trauma. At the time, of course, nobody called it betrayal trauma, but I did find a great Christian therapist who really helped me put the pieces of my life back together again. And over the course of a couple of years, it became clear that God was putting in me a passion for working with women both women who struggle with their own unwanted sexual behavior and women who've gone through sexual betrayal. Fast forward in 2010, I remarried, blended a family with my husband, Michael. And before we even married, we knew God was going to call us to use our stories of brokenness and pain and restoration as a ministry. So we started Living Truth in 2013, and we serve primarily men with unwanted sexual behavior and women who've experienced sexual betrayal. We also run groups for daughters who've been impacted by a parent's sexual betrayal. And we absolutely love what we do because we get to see restoration in the deepest valley, darkest places of people's lives. So that is a little bit about me and what I do and why God called me into a ministry like this. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's something that that uh, a lot of folks need to hear especially who are in maybe the, the the valleys right now of their own brokenness or their secrets or, or whatever else, is there is a sense in which where I'm at now, there's no usefulness that could ever come out of my life. There's no purpose or meaning. And so I think it's important that we we share our stories and say, not not to say that all of life now is, you know, a mountaintop, um, uh, but there is, there's a need, I think, for people to see that even out of the brokenness, God can produce something that is both meaningful and redemptive. Like there's a sense in which you can be of help and service to others who are in that same kind of situation. Well, and honestly, if I hadn't gone, I'm not saying God like wanted this to happen. I, I believe God is good, kind, loving, I think he took something horrible rooted in sin and darkness. And he, because I was willing to cooperate with the refining process, he actually used it to heal me on a deeper level than I even knew I needed like Mm -hmm. childhood wounds, because that's just how good he is. Right. He can take something so terrible and redeem it. Um, And it's changed me, not just so that I can be used, but so that I'm actually a more happy, whole, healthy person than I ever was before. So it's pretty remarkable yeah. what he does. Yeah. And I, and so the, the session that you did at SILS at the sexual integrity leadership summit was on this issue of, of the Emmanuel approach. And I, I really want, first of all, for you to just start to kind of define terms um, yeah. because this really was, this is connected to, prayer and counseling and a person's journey and all of that. So can you start to kind of just give us a a high level definition? What is the Emmanuel approach? 
So the Emanuel approach was developed by Christian psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Lehman. And actually on my podcast, the Living Truth podcast, I got to interview him. So there's a, a place where if somebody wants to hear more of Dr. Lehman's approach and where it came from, you could listen to that. But basically he, he's a psychiatrist, right? And so he's using things like EMDR to help people with trauma. And he just kept hitting these walls with some really severely traumatized people. And as a, as, as a Christ follower, he just went to the Lord and was like, what is this? Like, what do these people need? And one thing he realized as he developed a manual approach, which I, he says is a marriage of Christian spirituality with brain science, right? Because he started realizing that the issue wasn't that these people did not want to heal or they weren't willing. There was an issue of capacity, like in the brain, that was shutting them down to the point where they could not push past these trauma memories. So the Emmanuel approach uses prayer and inviting Jesus in and gets into the deeper levels of the brain to increase a sense of joy and to increase a sense of presence. And then also to be able to experience Jesus's real living presence. It's called the Emmanuel approach because Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he found that through using these prayer techniques that people increased their joy strength, their joy capacity, it increased or it turned on the relational circuits in their brain that had been shut down by trauma. And it actually increased their ability not only to push through and push past the trauma, but to connect with God in a deeper, more meaningful way. And so he started using this approach and found it incredibly effective for addressing trauma. Hmm. I personally have used it more in my ministry and the way I was using it at the Sexual Integrity Leadership Summit to just give people an experience of joy with Jesus. And um, that in and of itself, even if you never go to trauma memories, is a very healing experience that helps people increase their capacity. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. And, and uh, you know, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, okay, immediately I can imagine that some people go, whoa, 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 wait a second. This, this, this doesn't really sound like counseling the way I've heard it. It almost sounds like things that, especially for those that maybe have been either raised or are part of a, more of a maybe conservative tradition of Christianity or whatever, that this feels mystical. It almost feels like, are we trying to now take like Jesus and prayer as a technique in order to produce some kind of transformative outcome in a person's, you know, psych psychology or whatever. So how do you start to address maybe some of the fears yeah. or the apprehensions or the misunderstandings that people would have around this approach? Okay, Jonathan. So if you think about how we do Christianity in America, assuming a lot of our listeners are from a Western mindset, we tend to freak out at anything that sounds mystical or Eastern, when in fact, biblical truth was never from a Western mindset in the first place. We have culturally constructed things to boil Christianity down to a logic and truth vain. And Jesus was never about that in the first place. <laughs> Jesus was all about the heart. He was all about us. Um, yes, truth is important. Absolutely. But he was also all about the heart and healing our hearts and setting us free through his very presence. And so, um, yeah, he said, I think he said, that, I am the truth. Yeah. The so truth wasn't merely a concept. It was the incarnate God, right? So absolutely. He also said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But Jonathan, do we live, most of us as Christians, especially if we are struggling with unwanted sexual behavior and we're doing what we don't want to do, or we've experienced betrayal and we are stuck in trauma mode where our brain is a hamster wheel and we are not acting like ourselves because we're traumatized. Do we, are we living like Jesus is truly with us 
we're, most of us don't live like that day in and day out, mm-hmm. like where we are act, actually experiencing the presence, the living, breathing, powerful presence of Jesus in our lives. Yeah. And I think that is something that God wants for each of us. We just don't know how to get there sometimes. And as you're saying that, one of the things that pops into my head is I think, and I don't know if this is a Western thing, Eastern thing, or just a human thing, but I think we have often then made prayer into a very transactional activity. So like yeah. we have intercessory prayer, we have prayers of supplication, we have prayers and it's, it's almost like, okay, God, I say this and you do that. And then we have this exchange and I go on with my life. Like you're going to a vending machine. How is the Emmanuel approach vastly different from how maybe we have had more of a transactional prayer understanding in our lives. Because it's all about relational connection with Jesus. That's the thing about the relational or the, yeah, the relational approach of to prayer versus a transactional approach or a genie in the bottle (laughs) approach is how I would call it, where we go to God and we're like, okay, let me give you my three wishes and you do these things for me. Right. Where we're basically bossing God around and telling him what to do. Right. And this was me. And that led to a huge crisis of faith for me when my betrayal blew my whole life up because I really believed that I had this deal with God. I serve you. I do the right things. I live a good moral life. You do all these things for me. Like you protect me. Of course, you're going to heal my marriage, right? Why would it be your will that I become a single mother? Like that, that seems ridiculous. And then, and then your whole faith blows up when things don't go the way you think they should. Mm. I think that is a problem with our mindset and the relational approach involved with Eman- with the Emmanuel prayer is that it's really not about the answers to our questions, nor is it about getting what we want from God. It's about experiencing the two greatest needs that we are born with, joy and peace in connection with the living and breathing God. Now, as babies, it's joy and peace with our mothers and hopefully our fathers as in an attach, secure attachment relationship. Mm-hmm. But as we grow up, that um, con- constant presence is to become God instead of mom and dad. We transfer it to God. And so that love relationship, that constant contact with God is experienced, it, it just is accelerated through this Emmanuel approach. Well, and I want you to keep unpacking that relational approach. And the reason I, I want to keep digging more into that is because even that, if it's heard through a transactional lens, will be saying, okay, so what do I need to do in order to now <laughs> have this relational connection with God? And so I think it's much, much harder to shift the paradigm when we are so accustomed, maybe this is very much a Western thing, we are so accustomed to transactional relationships. And what I mean by that is, you know, business and commerce and all of that. We're even just the idea of being in a capitalistic society, it's very transactional. Um, how do we begin to even shift? And, and how does this Emmanuel approach really help a person take steps towards that? Because I think this is far more You've probably seen it even in your practice. It's far more difficult than just saying, let's have one session and then boom, all of a sudden you're going to have this deep abiding sense of the presence of God. And you're going to have this really rich, thriving, you know, dialogue with him. Help us understand what that relational approach really means. Okay. Well, first of all, if somebody were to take the steps of the Emmanuel approach and they were to just try to do it right now, like on their own. This is, this is so interesting, but it, it's really hard to do in the beginning by yourself. So I, especially when you're a, when we're a fast food microwave society, like let's have it now. Come on, God, I want to have it my way now. That's not how this works. It's, it's, it works much better when you do it with another person guiding you. And that really bugged me because I'm a very independent person, like by, by nature, like I'll do it myself kind of a thing. And that is not how God wired us or created us. He wants us to live in community and connection with others and with him. This Emmanuel approach works best, especially early on before we are really 
used to it when we're doing it with other people. Mm. It helps ret- it helps turn the relational circuits on in our brain when we're experiencing it with someone else. To this day, even though I've practiced it a bunch, I've I've shared it with other people and I've had other people lead me through it. I have about a hundred times more powerful experiences doing it when I allow somebody else to lead me through it mm. because of this relational factor in the brain. So I, that's a, an important thing to know. Um, when you boil it down to understanding kind of where this approach heads, Dr. Lehman unpacks this concept of deliberate appreciation being a very key factor in how to experience this kind of connection with Jesus. So instead of constant, like telling God what to do or asking him for things in that transactional approach that you're talking about, the Emmanuel approach is initially, it can be as simple as right now sitting outdoors or somewhere peaceful, somewhere where I can just sit and thank God for detailed things. Like, let's say I'm, I'm a nature person. So for me, in my new house that I just moved to, I'm sitting in my backyard and I am watching the birds. I am listening to what is happening. I'm getting present. And I'm saying, wow, Jesus, thank you for this sun on my face. I'm noticing everything that is happening in the moment. And I am not just thank you like, like a transaction, but more actually being present Mm -hmm. and thanking him. That is kind of an initial movement towards this new mindset of practicing the presence of God and experiencing the presence of Jesus Mm -hmm. is through this deliberate appreciation. I'll stop there. No, that's really good. And that's, I wanted to then go into a little bit more detail about what does this approach kind of focus on, uh, can you even maybe help us understand what would a what would a session like this look yeah. like? Um, and I know sometimes this can be difficult to do, let's say over a podcast, because it is a very experiential type of a thing. But how would you try to describe it for us in terms of what do you do with a client or how does one walk through this um, approach? Well, I have, I have most, most frequently in recent years done this with groups, actually, instead of one-on-one. You can certainly go a little deeper when you go one-on-one, but you start, when, you, when I'm doing this with a group, what I would say to a person is, I want you to just relax. You have to get your body and your brain to be in a place of calm. So if you're super anxious and tense, it becomes very difficult to connect with God because the deeper relational parts of our brain are locked up. And so just even deep breathing and scanning your body for um, tension and like breathing into and moving around so that you're like getting to a place of relaxation so you can be present and not be hypervigilant and alert is, is a first step. Then I would lead somebody to, to ask Jesus to help them remember a five bar experience. So when you have five bars on your cell phone, that mm-hmm. is your sign that your signal's super clear and that you're going to hear clearly on your phone. So a five bar memory with Jesus would be a time where you felt God's presence, a time where you experienced his nearness. So for me, I had a moment where I was in Colorado and God and I have a thing with the moon. Like he knows I love full moons. I just think they're fabulous. I get giddy when I see full moons. It's, it's a thing he has put in front of me in multiple different ways, surprising ways where I jump up and down. It just innately gets me in touch with this feeling of, Oh my gosh, look at how incredible God is. This is so beautiful. So when I asked him for a five bar memory, I remembered a time where I was walking, I was at a conference, I walked out of the conference and the full moon was rising over the Rocky Mountains and it was unbelievable. And I, I had just this joy in this experience of like, God, you, I really felt he did this for me. Like he knew this would light me up. And he is showing me his glory and his beauty. So that's an example of one of my five bar experiences. So I would ask people, most of the time, if somebody has walked with God for any length of time, they they have a five bar memory that comes up quickly. 
when you lead somebody to focus on one of those memories, it will start lighting up these relational circuits that God created in our brains, these joy circuits, right? And when we're just constantly in transactional relationships, joy shuts down. Mm. Joy is an ult- joy is a, is a deeply relational experience, whether that's joy in my relationship with God, with my child, with my spouse. And so um, the, this, this remembering this five bar experience can help start to turn those joy and relational circuits back on in the brain. So after a person has God bring to them their memory of this five bar moment, this experience and memory of a time with God that was powerful, I would just lead them through all five of their senses and basically revisiting that memory in their mind and the way that God created our brains, that we can recall memories, joyful memories and painful memories. Mm -hmm. We're basically leading them into this joyful memory and asking them to look, think through an experience, sink into their bodies all five of their senses. So I would ask them, so you're in this experience, like you're in the mountains and the, and the moon is rising over the mountains. What do you smell? And, and so in their memory, they would go back there basically and have this, the five senses in their five bar moment. And what this does is it helps them sink deeper into the joy and their, and, and the presence of that memory. Then I would lead them to look around and see, do you see Jesus? Okay. And most of the time people will have their eyes closed and they're in a posture where they're sinking into this memory. Sometimes people actually literally see Jesus in that memory. Other times, if you if you get super anxious doing this and you're freaking out and you're like, Jesus, where are you? Like <laughs> that turns on the anxiety circuits in your brain. Like it's, it defeats the purpose. And the thing is like, we're so afraid of doing things wrong or like not doing it right. And all of that types that type of fear and anxiety is counterproductive for this. Mm-hmm. So I'm very reassuring as I lead somebody through this Emmanuel approach, like there's no right way for this except to just relax and let go and enjoy your joyful memory. Because even if somebody doesn't perceive Jesus's presence, they're still reconnecting with a joyful memory where they felt close to God. And bare minimum, when they end the Emmanuel session, they're going to have experienced this kind of deeper relaxation of this wonderful memory that they had. And it's going to carry a a bit of peace into their day from there. But at best, I have had way too many people that I can count experience Jesus's presence through this on a very powerful level. And when time allows, allowing them to listen, to look at Jesus's face in the memory. You know, if Jesus is Emmanuel, he is always with us. The problem is not that Jesus wasn't there or isn't here now. It's that we don't perceive his presence. So what Emmanuel approach is helping us do is tune in to perceive him. Mm -hmm. You know, when Jesus resurrected from the dead and the disciples are walking along to Emmaus and like he shows up and starts talking to them. Remember how they didn't know it was him? Right. Like, don't you, when you read that, aren't you like, dude, how could you not know that was Jesus? (laughs) (laughs) Like it was Jesus in the flesh. We do that all the time. We don't even see or know him. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is um, a shift in our minds from, um, you know, bare minimal, like I'm only going to believe what I can actually physically see with my eyes. Like, no, like on a spiritual, emotional level, Jesus is present. We just don't see him or mm-hmm. perceive him. And we it's been like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, humanity is always, we're just blind to the spiritual realm a yeah. lot of times. Now I can hear, um, 
some some listeners asking, okay, I, I, I get it in terms of, hey, going to this really joyful experience, a five bar moment, um, trying to bring in the five senses, what see the presence of Jesus in that in that beautiful memory. Um, now, how does this apply to my trauma or how does this apply to my recovery or where do I go from there when it come when I'm, when we're talking about I've been addicted to porn for 20 years or so help us understand what this process does and why it's so critical and how it then does connect to healing the deep and broken places in our in our lives. Well, I would definitely not use it for trauma without a trained professional present, Yeah. Um, nor would I even expect that your listeners would listen to this and immediately have this profound experience. Like I would, um, I would encourage them to like seek out a group or a practitioner that uses a manual approach. And if you Google Dr. Carl Lehman and his website, there's a lot, there's some directories and resources there to find it. He also has a YouTube channel where you can like experience this on your own. But what I will say is that the bare minimum, if all you're doing is is the the basic group principle that I just described, where you're going into the five bar memory, what you're doing is you are you are regulating your anxiety and your emotions, your intense emotions that are like creating the problems that have led to the the addiction in the first place, or if you're the betrayed partner the anxiety of this lack of safety in your marriage. And you are turning on these joy and relational circuits in your brain. They get shut down by your trauma and your mm-hmm. fear so that you can start to think more clearly and logically again. So if you think about sex addiction and unwanted sexual behavior as an attempt to either soothe pain, right? Or to, continue to numb and freeze out your traumatic experiences at the bare minimum of using a manual approach just for the relational circuits to be turned on and the joy to be increased. You're experiencing something authentic joy with connection with God that you were, that's why you were using the porn in the first place. You were using this counterfeit to seek a counterfeit relational experience. Mm -hmm. This is the real thing, right? Yeah. That's one of the things that popped into my head is your, the exercise is really kind of training you of what does it mean to be fully present? Because if, I mean, like you said, Emmanuel is God with us, but you know what? Sometimes we don't feel like we're with God. (laughs) And so I feel like what you're saying is this is opening us up to experiencing what it's like to be fully present and not feel like, hey, I've got to run away or I've got to numb out or I've got to ignore and invalidate some of the hard feelings that I'm having or some of the temptations that I'm feeling. Or like you said, with a betrayed spouse, some of the fears that are going on or the anger. And what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is this is helping you lean in and say, this is what it feels like to be present and also maybe to recognize and talk a little bit about this, also maybe to recognize that in the um, realities of our brokenness, there have been five bar moments of of great joy and great light and great hope. And I think what you're what you're also doing in this is letting people see that, you know what, your whole life has not been overshadowed by the darkness that you're feeling maybe right now. Speak a little bit to that about how hopeful this process is and this approach is for people. Absolutely. Well, it's hopeful because, too because in the midst of the pain and suffering of dealing with your unwanted sexual behavior or as the betrayed spouse, dealing with the betrayal, you want to hit it all the time and like, you know, like recovery. Okay. The grueling work of recovery. If you don't have enough joy strength, if you don't have enough emotional and relational capacity, it's like when you Every time I on Thanksgiving, I plug my air fryer in in my brother's. Um, he has this like pantry that has plugs in it, and there's two air fryers, and I'm trying to air fry the Brussels sprouts. And every time I break this, I flip the breaker or whatever. Like I over, I, and my brother has to remind me, hey, plug that air fryer in over here somewhere else where there's more capacity. 
this is what happens to us. The, the breaker flips, we, it shuts down. We hit a, we hit a wall very quickly of our emotional capacity when we're in trauma mode, when we're in early recovery, or even if we've not had good solid recovery, even if we've been doing it for years. And so what this does is it increases our capacity through joyful building joyful circuitry in the brain with God. Mm -hmm. So um, it is, you're right. It is very hard to see joyful moments with God from our past when this kind of pain and betrayal overshadows, but that is very black and white thinking to say that the whole, my whole life has been just trash, (laughs) you know? That is what trauma does though. It, it, it moves us into more black and white thinking, but this type of a joyful relational connection with God helps move us more into the reality of life, which is that there is joy and suffering interwoven throughout our stories. And that kind of brings us full circle. You know, Jesus said, I am the truth. So this is a bringing us into alignment with what's actually true. Stop using terms like always, never, you know, it's like, being in the presence of, of, of Jesus, you realize, oh my goodness, there's, there's a lot more nuance and there's a lot more things that I've just not been able to see because I've been blinded by my, my brokenness. But we're, we're, we're wrapping up here. We've got a couple minutes left and I just wanted to, to see if there's you know, any other things that you might want to share with our audience that you think might be helpful in terms of them understanding the Emmanuel approach. And then also where can people go to get more information and resources from you guys and, and regarding this approach? Yes. Um, so I think if you're wanting to just take one next right step, going to Dr. Carl Lehman's website, if you really want to learn more, um, and his YouTube channel is a great next step. Um, his material is extensive. His book is like very thick. So if you just want to like dip your toe in, Go to living-truth.org and look up the Living Truth podcast, which is on our website. And there's two-part series of me interviewing Dr. Lehman. That is a great first step. Um, We do use a manual approach with partners, um, with betrayed partners. My husband uses a variation of this with the men that he works with, with unwanted sexual behavior. More information about all of that also on living-truth.org. And... I think it's just a very hopeful next step to practice this being present and deliberate appreciation. So pulling out a journal, sitting in a place that's like your happy place. Okay. For me, it's outside in nature and just look around, tune into all five of your senses and say, Jesus, I know you're here. I, I might not see you, but I know you're here and you made this beautiful sky and you made these birds and listening and tuning in to what you hear, what you smell, what you what you can feel, what you can see, and dialoguing with Jesus about it, mm-hmm. deliberately appreciating down to the details. Like, look at how red that cardinal is. You made that vibrant color, Lord. Wow, that's amazing. It just brings you joy it can bring you joy to set aside the the panic and the pain and the and the overwhelm of this world and get present with what god has made mm-hmm. and what he's giving you in this moment yeah that's great and we're also going to uh uh listeners Kristen had also sent us a couple of bonuses uh some bonus resources that we're going to be linking to which is um one of them is top 10 tips to rebuild your marriage after betrayal, which is an ebook. And then also the path to freedom, which is an ebook. And so we will also be linking to that in the show notes, but Kristen, thank you for the work you've done in this. Thank you for the conversation today. We've really enjoyed having you on the program. Jonathan, thank you so much. It was a joy to be here. Yeah. And listeners, like I said, there's going to be a lot of incredible resources and information that we are going to post in the show notes, uh, linking to Dr. Lehman's information and those resources from Kristen and what they're doing at Living Truth. But we're always glad that you're with us. If you need more help and just want somebody to kind of walk alongside you on this journey, please reach out to us. 
And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care. 